on today's episode of Mile Higher. We can't believe it. We have none other than Graham Hancock joining us today. The universe has gifted us this amazing planet and these colossal opportunities to learn and grow and develop. I'm afraid of it because of the idea that DMT is released in our brains Mm -hmm. when we die. And I fear that maybe I'm not supposed to experience that until I die. It's hypocritical to live in a society that glorifies alcohol on the one hand and that demonizes psychedelics on the other. I reconnected with my spirituality through the use of psychedelics because it really showed me that this is a spiritual Mm. realm that we're in. It's all around us. Do you have hope for humanity that we can reconnect with spirit? I I do see, again, the propaganda war trying to suggest that cannabis is connected in some way to, to negative and violent behavior, but I don't see that. I'm grateful to Ayahuasca for giving me the insights about stuff I needed to fix. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 257. And today we are all in for a treat because we have a guest on the show who we have wanted on our show for years. We have talked about this person pretty much since the dawn of this show and have kind of joked around about how it would be our dream to have him in person, get to talk to him one day. And that day is actually here. We can't believe it. We have none other than Graham Hancock joining us today. Well, thank you for that that kind uh, in- introduction. I, I do hope I live up to your dreams. <laughs> just having you here is living up to my dreams. This is just, it feels like a dream, like a manifestation almost for us because right. we really, you know, have always looked to your work. We bring up your work constantly thank on you. this show. If you've been watching for a long time, you guys know just how much of what we talk about goes back to ideas that Graham has presented or right. shared yeah. with people. So if you don't know Graham, He's an author, Mm -hmm. journalist, brilliant mind, and we're actually going to be doing two episodes today. Well, you'll see one of them next week, but Mm -hmm. today we're going to be talking specifically about psychedelics, the war on consciousness, the war on drugs, and I'm sure we'll get into a lot of other things. I'm sure we we will. Here, yes. Yeah, I'm trying to remember going back to the very beginning of our show. I believe like our second episode was on ancient Egypt. We're kind of Mm -hmm. diving into some of some of the interesting. Yeah. things that you propose especially when it comes to the pyramids and sure. and that was just kind of the start i mean obviously we uh we found you via joe rogan experience yeah. and yeah. you know we're absolutely captivated by just i think what you're doing is truly unique thank you and it's 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 such a shame that you've gotten so much flack and backlash for for just trying to mm. seek out the truth and yeah it, I, it, it's possible to have a I have a different perspective on that. I, I mean, you know, a concentrated energy of hatred sent sent my way by yeah. actually a relatively small group of extremely angry archaeologists and their friends in the media, uh, and the lies that they present and and the the false statements that they that they make about me that that does hurt, mm-hmm. um, especially you know when they when they try and say that I'm some sort of racist or, or yeah, that's the white latest supremacist, one, like. you know, all these sort of labels. Um, it's, it's hurtful. It, it's, it's, it's painful. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm married to a, a woman of color. We, we have mixed race children. We have mixed race grandchildren. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, it's very painful to hear that, that kind of bullshit being, being yeah. said about me. But at the same time, um, you know, I have to, I have to realize that I'm getting these attacks because I'm touching a nerve, uh, and and therefore, in a sense, it comes with the with the territory. Uh, and although those who those who are bitterly a, a opposed to me dress up what they're doing as as reasonable, objective attacks on me, that is that is not what's going on here. It's a propaganda war, and it's an attempt to control the narrative. And this this applies a, a, a across both of my primary areas of interest, which is the possibility of a lost civilization during the Ice Age, 
and the whole issue of altered states of consciousness and and psychedelics. And it's interesting that one of the that one of the the things that archaeologists use to attack my work on the possibility of a lost civilization is they say, "Oh, Hancock takes drugs, so he's right. obviously a lunatic." Right. Yeah, <laughs> he's I been mean, high such for a cheap, twenty years. Easy, yeah. Such a cheap, easy way. Yeah to write off an opponent mm -hmm. and and um you know frankly i'm i'm disappointed in them but the the attacks were not were not unexpected yeah. and and uh, I, perhaps i would even have been disappointed if i wasn't attacked because it would mean i wasn't over the target you know well the fact that you're getting acknowledged either yeah. way you know they say that negative public publicity isn't necessarily bad publicity no. you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's still attention that they're bringing to you and they're yeah they're highlighting highlighting you maybe in a um false way mm. but at the same time it's bringing more eyes to yeah. you yeah well when a journalist publi publishes a piece about my netflix series saying this is the most dangerous yeah. show on netflix well you know the, the chances are that the people are going to find out want to find out why it's dangerous, yeah, why is it dangerous? And, and, and then looking at it you know and, the, and, the, and then accusing me of racism when race is not even mentioned in the series at yeah. all mm -hmm. uh people are going to start asking asking questions so i'm glad that it's created a a, a global conversation Around around this, and and that uh, you know the ideas that I have to put forth have 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 reached a, a very wide audience. This is this is good. It's it's good, and I'm prepared to put up and deal with the with the attacks. I find it particularly strange that people say it's racist when you're spending so much time in that series actually interviewing people yeah. who belong in this culture yeah. and are sharing stories of their yeah, ancestors. Exactly. exactly. Um, and you have the utmost respect for those yeah. cultures. Yes, indeed, and... indeed. My whole my whole working life, all the the investigations pursued pursued over well over thirty years, have been in indigenous cultures ar around the world, and and I have huge respect for those cultures. And simply by relaying their traditions and their mm -hmm. myths uh, and their stories, uh, I am suddenly accused of being of being a racist. I think I think those who are accusing me are the racists, really, in this respect. I would agree. With that. Um, and it's and it's such it's such a diversion. In setting, instead of getting to grips with the, with the main issues, yeah, is is something missing from the human story? Uh, should we be looking closely in areas that we haven't looked yet? I suspect we'll get into more of this in in the other discussion. Absolutely. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 For those that don't know, I, I kind of want to get into just a little bit of your background, just for those out there who may not have heard of you before, but. He was, you know, he's the host and producer of Ancient Apocalypse, which is on Netflix. You may or may not have seen it. It's excellent. Um, yeah, we 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 just finished watching it the other day, and mm -hmm. so many so many questions with that, which will be in the next episode that we do with him next week. But for this episode, we really wanted to focus on kind of going through your journey mm -hmm. uh, from the beginning and kind of what got you interested in altered states of consciousness. So during the 80s and 70s. I mean, I'm look. I'm 72 years old now. 72 you don't look is my it. next birthday. <laughs> Thank you. But you, you know, I've been I've been on the road for a long time, and and during the the 70s and 80s, um, I was a reporter, and my focus was very much on on current affairs, and uh, I was the East Africa correspondent of the Economist, and I was based in Nairobi in Kenya, and I got to know. All of the countries in that in that region e extremely extremely well, um, and and it was there in Ethiopia that I came across a story and a tradition. And again, we'll go into this in more detail in the other interview. That raised in my mind the possibility that there might be a forgotten episode in human history, and I then devoted many years to pursuing pursuing that inquiry. Uh, Fingerprints of the Gods was published in 1995, and that's that's probably my my best known book on the lost civilization mystery. But there are many others, more recent Magicians of the Gods, America Before. But one of those books, published in 2002, was called Underworld. And at that point, I thought wrongly that I'd reached the end of the inquiry. My wife Santa, who's a photographer, and I, we do everything together. Spent seven years scuba diving on the continental shelves in areas that were submerged by rising sea levels at the end of the ice age. I mean, you know, we, we really do, do put our lives on the line yeah. to pursue this inquiry. And we found, found that with the help of local fishermen and local divers, extraordinary structures underwater. And I wrote something like an 800 page book with 2000 footnotes because I knew that all my work gets attacked. So I tried to bulletproof every argument. And I thought, right, I'm done with this. I've, there's, there's really nothing more that I can usefully contribute to this issue of a lost civilization. That was back in 2002. Wow. What am I interested in now? 
And and I thought, well, w- one of the things that interests me is is human origins and the the origins of what we regard as as modern human behavior. Where did this where did this come from? And of, I have to pay tribute to the late great Terence McKenna, absolutely uh, yeah. a, a brilliant a brilliant speaker, a brilliant mind, a, a genius in every way. And his stoned ape theory yeah. <laughs> uh, is, a, is a fascinating idea that it was encounters. Of course, our, our hunter-gatherer ancestors were sampling everything that could be food. And it's inconceivable that they missed psychedelics. Of right. course they did. Yeah, they obviously ran across them at some point. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, Terence suggested that that was the key that turned on the modern human mind. And then at the same time, uh, a, a, a professor at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, back in the 60s and, and 70s, uh, was working on what he calls the neuropsychological model of cave art. His name is David Lewis Williams, um, and he's looking at at uh, cave paintings all around the world, not only in South Africa but in Europe, in in Indonesia, everywhere. And and uh, he pointed out correctly, in my view, that that the characteristic image imagery of these paintings uh, is the kind of thing that you see in a deeply altered state of consciousness. Mm. Whether uh, and and so he proposed that in ancient times, shamans were taking psychedelics or using other means to enter deeply altered states of consciousness. They could, if they wished to starve themselves for a month, uh, you know, they could, they could uh, do meditation, right. uh, impose austerities of all kinds of, uh, upon. There's, there are various ways to get into the altered state of consciousness. It's just the psychedelics are the, are the most efficient. And, and um, that they were experiencing these visions and then when they returned to a, a normal everyday state of, state of consciousness, they would remember what they'd seen in the vision and they would paint it on the cave walls. And there are certain characteristic elements which, which include geometric patterns, scintillating zigzag lines, flows of dots, and most important of all, entities, uh, which very often take the form of animals, sometimes take the form of human beings, but most often take the form of, of creatures that are part animal, part human in form. And the technical term for those is therianthropes. And that's from the, the Greek therion, which means wild beast, and anthropos, which means man. And obviously, this is not something that a hunter-gatherer sees in everyday life while out pursuing game. Right, you don't right. see a creature that's part eland and, and part man, or that's part lion and part human being. Um, and and uh, the presence of all of these together, the geometric patterns and the, the therianthropic entities, are, are characteristic of of altered states of consciousness, and really nothing else. And the combination of them in art suggested very strongly that those ancient artists had been, had been working with psychedelics. And this coincides. We don't know whether before the cave art, we can't say for sure whether those ancient ancestors were painting their bodies. They may have been painting their bodies long before they painted cave walls, uh, but the bodies have not survived. What has survived is the, is the cave paintings. Um, but but it seems to coincide with a with a sudden leap forward in human behavior, and this is where Terence McKenna was 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 right. You know that that this I can't say that psychedelics caused this. That that needs more work. Right. But there's a correlation between the evidence of deep psychedelic experiences in the the cave art um, and this sudden leap forward in in human behavior. And I thought, well. Actually, this is the interesting issue in human origins. I don't really need to go back six million or eight million years to the or to the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee and go into all of that. A lot of which is frankly pretty yeah, boring. Yeah. Uh, what I what I need to do is focus on this moment when human beings started expressing symbolism of this particular kind. Well, I am it, when I research a book, uh, I immerse myself fully in it. I will not write about something that I have not experienced. That's why I spent seven years scuba diving to write about the flooded continental shelves and, and the structures that, that lie underwater. And it became, it became obvious to me that I had to have, I had to have psychedelic experiences. Um, and furthermore, I learned that the shamans in the Amazon rainforest were doing exactly what we believe the ancient artists were doing. They were, they were consuming ayahuasca, um, having powerful visionary experiences, remembering those experiences and then painting them. Uh, and those paintings have a huge amount in common with the cave art. So it was a no-brainer for me. I had to go to the Amazon. I had to drink ayahuasca. I had to have this experience myself if I was going to write in any way authentically about it. What, what I didn't know was that those first 11 journeys 
in the Amazon would be the beginning of a lifelong journey, uh, but I would continue to work with ayahuasca. I mean, anybody who says that uh, ayahuasca is addictive just has no idea what they're talking about. You have, yeah. it, 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 it's physically very demanding and, and emotionally and, and psychically very demanding too. You have to brace yourself for the experience. But I've learned so much from it that I've braced myself many, many times over the last years. The last time I drank ayahuasca was 2019, so several years ago now. I will, I'm not in a rush to drink it again. I suppose I've had about 70 sessions of, over the years. Um, but it's been, it's been a profoundly meaningful experience for me. And I feel that I'm enrolled in a school which doesn't require me to attend lessons every day. Yeah. But but when I'm ready for those for those lessons, that school that school is there and has and has more to teach me. So that's how that's how it began. If you've listened to this show before, you've probably heard me talk about Simply Safe and how Josh and I love their system for our home security. And Simply Safe is constantly innovating. They're always working on the next thing to help keep you and your loved ones safe 24 seven, like their new two-in-one smoke and CO detector. It's generation hazard detection that distinguishes between fire and cooking smoke so your home is protected and you get fewer false alarms. We love Simply Safe because it is so simple. I mean, it's easy to set up, it's simple to use. I love being able to have the app set up right on my phone and I can see cameras around my house at any time, especially when I'm home alone. <laughs> that is when I use it the most to just see what's going on. Sometimes you hear a weird sound, it's nice to pull up your phone and check out your cameras. Janelle actually just bought a house and set up Ooh. her Simply Safe system. How was that? Simply Safe is lit, you guys. I'm telling you, it was actually very easy to set up on your own, which I like. You don't have to get anyone to come to your house and do it for you. I think one of my favorite new things that I have is a lock on my front door that has a keypad. Yes. Very convenient. That. So convenient. With Simply Safe's 24 7 professional monitoring service, trained agents stand ready to respond to an emergency, dispatching police, firefighters, or EMTs right to your door, even if you're away or can't be reached. And monitoring service costs under a dollar a day. So, right now, you can get 20% off your new system when you sign up for interactive monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash mile higher. That's simplysafe.com. And that's simply spelled with an I, simplysafe.com slash mile higher. There's no safe like Simply safe. I had had one powerful psychedelic journey before that, and that was purely by chance at a festival in Britain in 1974. And um, mm -hmm. I was with two friends, and if I recall correctly, we used a razor blade to cut a tab of acid into three slices. Nice. nice. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I had one of those, and my two friends had one slice each. And then I just went off and wandered all night. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had the most magical, just amazing, beautiful, exciting, enthralling experience. Did that kind of switch things on for you after that? Well, like... I don't know. Because when I, when I went back to the tent, I found one of my friends, uh, this was some 11 or 12 hours later, I found one of my friends in a state of total despair. Oh, no. Oh, and, yeah. and he had had a ghastly journey. And the whole universe had collapsed around yeah. his head and he was in a state of complete hopelessness. I took him, I pulled him out of the tent and said, let's go for a walk. He went, <laughs> yeah. went for a walk and I was still somewhat in the state. <laughs> so so what, what I saw initially was a group of elves wearing blue clothes, carrying wands, walking in line across the field towards us. And I turned to Peter and I said, are those elves? <laughs> and he said, he said, no, Graham, they're the police. <laughs> and the ones were their, batons, were their, their, yeah. their batons. Oh, wow. And they had come to break up the festival, you know, so it was a sudden grounding in, grounding in yeah, reality like, oh. there. And we, we um, fled, you know, because they got very violent. There were a lot of people hurt by the police on, oh, wow. that, on that occasion. This was 1974. I was, mm -hmm. I was 24 years old, maybe even at the end of being 23. I'm not quite sure of the date. But, but um, uh, afterwards, I thought, suppose my incredibly powerful experience with LSD, which was so beautiful and so enthralling and so wonderful, suppose it went the other way. Yeah. And, I, and I had a really horrific experience with LSD. Could I even handle it? And for many years after that, I did not touch any psychedelics again. I didn't touch them again until 2003 oh, when wow. I came to research uh, the book that that was initially titled Supernatural and is now titled Visionary, which was an exploration uh, of altered states of consciousness and on their role in the development of human consciousness. 
And the subtitle of that book is Meetings with the Ancient Teachers of Mankind. As I said, to write that book authentically, I needed to have these experiences. And the first experience was with, was with ayahuasca um, because that was so connected to art right. in, in the Amazon. And then it became a longer journey uh, from, from, from there. Uh, that took me, you know, quite quite deeply down the road, and I I do feel strongly that psychedelics are are important medicines. They're powerful medicines, and and um, I also feel that they are not for children. Uh, this is not something Absolutely. that kids should have access to. There are certain things in in our society that are rightly reserved for adults, mm. and I think psychedelics are one of those. And and I I actually am c- quite convinced that we will have more success in keeping substances that can be disturbing to, to teenagers or, or kids, or keeping them away from those substances. If we can just say to them, look, wait till you're 21 right. and then do the journey. Yeah. You know, that's your choice. Just, just hold on. There's no mad rush. It's available there. You know, let your mind mature a little bit and, and you'll, find it, you'll find it a more beneficial experience. Whereas now with the, the sort of illegal market, there's, there's yeah. all sorts of nonsense going on and drug dealers are taking advantage of it and, and the, the whole thing gets very messy. The whole... The whole the whole case for, for, for I'm, I am in favor of the legalization of all drugs. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I, I, I don't lo- particularly like to use the word drug. It's too general. It carries yeah. too yeah. much baggage. But to use that, I think, I think that what adults decide to experience in the inner sanctum of their own consciousness while doing no harm to others. Key right there. Key. Yes. That is key. That is their own business, mm-hmm. and it is not the business of the government, and it is not the business of the police. It's the business of those adults. We already have so many laws that deal with harm that we might do to others. We, that's fully covered, but we don't need laws that tell us what we may or may not experience with our own consciousness, that we may not grow and develop our own consciousness in our own way by our own choices. That's an abuse of human rights that's taking place right there. And it's been dressed up in propagandistic language for decades. And people have got very locked into that and, and find it difficult to think outside the box in that area. But fortunately, we are now seeing really important medical studies that are beginning to, that are beginning to take away that sort of demonic image that psychedelics were given back in the 60s right, and 70s. Right. And, and people are beginning to realize that these are wonderful medicines and that they can be incredibly helpful Post-traumatic stress disorder, um, psilocybin, very effective in, in healing that. MDMA also, although it's not really a classic mm-hmm. psychedelic. Right. Um, and and um, depression, which is a terrible problem uh, in the industrialized countries. And people get locked for years into dependence on, on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, yep. SSRIs like Prozac and, and, and Siroxat. I, I speak from experience because I had an episode of depression and, and I, was, um, I was initially on Prozac and then on Siroxat and it, it just made everything worse for me and it numbed me yeah. and I, I, I hated it and detested it. But when I reached the point where I, I said to myself, I can't do this, I can't take these vile medicines anymore, I have to stop. Then I started having really worrying thoughts. I cut it completely, the Siroxat, and I did start having suicidal thoughts, kind of cold and rational thoughts. You know, you need to kill yourself, Graham. Uh, and then I realized I had a problem yeah. with these pharmaceutical drugs, right. which had been prescribed by my GP, you know, my general mm-hmm. practitioner. So, so I went back and, and we worked out a regime where I could gradually cut down over six months. And after six months, I got free of those horrible, horrible antidepressants. And, and now what is being realized is that just one major psilocybin trip, not micro, microdosing also has a very important role to play, but one full on psilocybin trip can end depression completely. And why? Because, because it, it seems to reset the brain. It's it's like we get locked. That's what depression is. Actually, Mm -hmm. it's getting locked into a very narrow pattern of behavior where the same thoughts keep on going around and around and you can't, you can't break out of it. Psychedelics just break that lock. And, and I, I'm not saying they're going to do it for everybody all the time, but the science is showing that it, they're very effective in doing it um, and, and uh, in, in much less harmful ways, actually harmless ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, Virtually no side effects. No there. side yeah. effects at all. You know? so, so it's madness that our society has had this propaganda war against psychedelics for so long. It's good that we're beginning to think about how to reintroduce these into society, and it's good 
that some states, particularly in the United States, are are legalizing cycling. Colorado, man. Colorado. Yeah. 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 Colorado, you know, leads the leads the way in in many in many of these areas. I often say this, but you know, I come from Britain and we have um a, a sort of strong central government in Britain, which mm-hmm. is the, supposed to be the the government of England and Scotland and Ireland and Northern Ireland and and, and Wales. Um, and we have many counties in Britain, like Yorkshire and Northumberland and Lancashire, just as America has many, right. many states. But it's inconceivable in Britain that Yorkshire could decide to make cannabis legal while Westminster disagreed. Yeah. It right. just couldn't happen. Whereas in America, it can happen. Right. Mm-hmm. The Citizens individual can states. make their yeah. voice heard and they can make decisions for themselves. And I, I hugely respect uh, America for that, and Colorado in particular, yeah. as being one of the very first states to, if I remember correctly, to legalize, to legalize yeah. cannabis. Yep. Yep. Um, and of course, cannabis should be legal. Yeah. It's absurd that it's illegal. It's absurd that we live in a society that glorifies alcohol, yep. one of the most dangerous drugs on the planet, which causes fights, which causes road accidents, mm-hmm. which causes massive liver, liver damage, which is very unhealthy in many ways. I mean, I don't, I don't want to put down pe- people who drink alcohol. Welcome. Everybody needs to make, make their own choice. But it's, a, it's hypocritical to live in a society that glorifies alcohol on the one hand mm-hmm. and that demonizes psychedelics on the other. This is, this is nuts. Why do you think that is, though? Well, I think, I think <laughs> it's pretty clear yeah. that psychedelics lead people to ask questions about yes. the prevailing Bingo. reality. It's yeah. as simple as that. And I think those, those in power knew that long ago. And they, they knew that psychedelics represented a danger to the established order of things, not to the individuals taking the psychedelics, but to the established order of things, that people couldn't be so easily brainwashed that they'd start to think for themselves, make decisions for themselves, would start to question government behavior and the behavior of big corporations and the behavior of the big religions too. Yeah, All of these yeah. would be questioned uh, from, from people who'd had deep experiences with psychedelics. So the decision was made, let's wage a propaganda war against psychedelics. Mm-hmm. Let's make people believe that these are really deadly, harmful, harmful things. Instill when when, it, when in fact they're not, you know? Yeah. I mean, look, uh, if, if somebody has, has very serious mental issues, if somebody is, is you know, schizophrenic in a, in a bad way, I would not recommend that person Absolutely. to take psychedelics. Yeah. Right. I, would, I would say that's probably not the way to go. And if and if they were to go that way, that then it would need to be very carefully managed, uh, and 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 I I think that, that that psychedelics can tip some people over the edge, but it's not the psychedelics that are the yeah. problem. It's the person themselves and what they're bringing to the party. That's that's the issue. And the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of adults are perfectly capable of handling psychedelics. We're all grown ups, right. and we can make decisions about our own lives. And then the questions come. And we start, we start realizing, first of all, that we've been lied to for decades about these substances. And then what else have we been lied to about? Right. You, know? you start digging in and you're yeah. like, oh, start there's a lot more. <laughs> so this is, this is fundamentally what's at stake. And, 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 and beyond that, um, the, the, the fundamental issue, which, which I call the adult sovereignty over consciousness, that, that as adults, our fundamental human rights should be to be able to make sovereign decisions about our own consciousness while doing no harm to others. Um, and and um, yet we live in a society that opposes that, that wants us to take the word of so-called experts on everything, yeah. wh- whether, it, whether it's on religion or what we're going to buy next week uh, or the kind of government we have. We're supposed to listen to experts and just be taught by them rather than- Take their they, word for it. Take their word for it. rather. Than, mm-hmm. and, and I think the cult of the expert in our society is-, is uh, they feel quite, threatened. That's they for feel, sure. They feel they feel threatened by psychedelics, and it's mm-hmm. quite a negative. It's quite a negative thing. This cult of the expert. There's a place for experts, of course. We need expertise in all kinds of areas, but they shouldn't have a, a monopoly uh, over what people decide to do. And that's particularly true in relation to individual consciousness. Well, like you've said before, it's like, are we truly free unless we have control over our own consciousness? Yeah, and and we cannot be. We cannot mm-hmm. claim any kind of freedom. All other freedoms are trivial. Yeah. Uh, if our consciousness is controlled by someone else. Uh, and you can see this in, in, a, in a state like, like China, where, where there is a very focused, kind of almost above board effort to control the consciousness right. of everybody. In Western societies, that same effort is going on, but it's more subtle and clever. Yeah. And, it's, mm-hmm. and it's played through the, through the media in ways that people don't realize that their consciousness is being, is being controlled. So psychedelics have the potential to bust that whole house of cards and bring it tumbling down. And, and that has to be a good thing because the present state of consciousness 
is not is not serving humanity well. No. It is it is it is there's nothing wrong with it. I call it the alert problem solving state of consciousness. It has a place. It's important. We need it, but it shouldn't have a monopoly. And in societies that give a monopoly to that state of consciousness and allow us, you know, little hol- holidays like getting drunk, uh, you know, alcohol, that's why alcohol's allowed or 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 allows us to carry on functioning uh, for a few more years by giving us antidepressants. Yeah, caffeine, stuff like that. Caffeine, you yeah. know, all, 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 all of those, all of those things. Um, that, that's, that, that kind of society is, is controlling our, is controlling our minds in ways that we, that we don't realize. And, and, um, as I've gone deeper and deeper into the psychedelic journey, I've learned that, I've learned that more and more, uh, that, that we, we need to think for ourselves, uh, and, and we cannot allow the alert problem solving state of consciousness to have a complete monopoly because look at the mess it's making of the world. Mm. The, the alert, Mm -hmm. The alert problem-solving state of consciousness created and continues to nurture and develop nuclear weapons. The alert problem-solving state of consciousness is what is involved in all the financial markets all around the world. It's what runs the big corporations. And I'm sorry, but it's what runs the big religions too. Yeah. Uh, their, their, their priests and their rabbis and their mullahs are, are not uh, having direct contact with the divine. They, they are just experts too. In a certain in a certain group of teachings, and they and they tend to impose themselves between us and the divine, whatever the divine is, uh, and and say these are our teachings. Follow these teachings. Follow them to the letter. Uh, do not stray right. in in any way. Well, we should be straying all the mm-hmm. time. That's what it is to be human. And if we don't stray, and if we stay locked into these narrow places forever, we're we're going, we're going to destroy our world. Uh, and 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 um, that's why I've I've often said. If I had my way, I would I would insist that anybody running for high political office, anybody who's running mm-hmm. for president of the United States, anybody who's running for prime minister of Britain, anybody who's running to rush the, r- r- run Russia uh, or China, uh, they should have a minimum of twelve ayahuasca sessions first. I love that rule. Yeah, that you know should be that, that that should just absolutely be in state. If it, you know, listen, if you can't handle twelve ayahuasca sessions, then you should not be running a country. And Amen. if you and if you have twelve ayahuasca sessions, if you still want to run a right, country, that's the key, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> which is which is probably quite unlikely. But if you still want to, you're going to run it in a much better way, a much more nurturing, much more thoughtful, much more caring way, and much less about your own bloody ego and 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 more about the high responsibility that's been placed upon you. That's such a big part of it too, yeah. is dismantling your ego. When yeah. I've done psychedelics uh, myself, mm. that's the first part I go through. Yeah. Is it just hits you like Death a ton of, the of ego. bricks. Yeah. Death of the ego. You yeah. realize so many things. You start to question things. And I've noticed that by the end of it, almost every time I have a psychedelic trip, I start thinking about all the people in my life that I know need this so bad. It yeah. makes me feel sad. Yeah. And that sometimes sad. I feel sad that I don't live in this state all the time. Like yeah. I start to realize how trapped I am by society. Yeah. We all are. I sometimes I remember the first time I literally felt I am in prison. Yeah. Most of my life. Yes, we, we are. We live in a, a, pr- a prison planet in, yeah. in, in, in many ways. Another interesting thing which relates to what you're saying ab- about psychedelics, uh, and again, those who've not worked with psychedelics may not, may not know this, is that a large part of the psychedelic experience for many people is dealing with your own baggage. You know? mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You get confronted with, with your own behavior and how you have functioned in the world. I do, constantly. And, and, and what's happening there is you're being given an opportunity to see the impact that you have on others, which might quite often be a negative impact, and mm. to and to learn from that, and and to, at least you can't you know go back and not do the or say the words that you regretted saying to that person five years ago, but psychedelics will show you that person's pain mm. from those harsh words that you said, and you've got the choice then not to do that again in the in the future. So, so, so that curiously, there's a strong moral element. To psychedelics, the teachings that come with with psychedelics uh, seem to be intended in some way to make us better people yeah. or to give us the opportunity. To, it's not a magic pill. Yeah, it's not going to make you. It's a better It's not going to make you a better person, but it's going to give you the opportunity. And I and 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 I think it's it, it's very clear that that's when the work really begins. It begins after the session. Mm-hmm. You've learned stuff that you needed to know. And do you then integrate that into your life? And that and that's often very very hard work, but it's important. It's important work to do, and at least at least it gives us the chance. Whereas alcohol and the antidepressants are not going to do that at all in mm-hmm. in, in any way. I mean, nobody 
as far as I know, is having deep insights while drunk. No. Yeah. Least of all about their moral behavior. No. You know? Yeah. They say the truth comes out though, you know, when you're drunk. In Vino Veritas, <laughs> yes. Sometimes but, in very bad ways. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm yeah. curious if you have had any experience with ketamine. No, I haven't. Um, really? Ketamine is missing from my um, psychedelic uh, journeys. Mm. Uh, I've I've heard very interesting things about it. I will uh, I will have a ket ketamine experience at some point in the future, um, but thus far thus far I've not. Uh, my my experiences have been uh, limited to, well, LSD, um, psilocybin from various types of mushrooms, uh, DMT, mm. recently 5-MeO DMT. The other DMT is called NNDMT, and then there's 5-MeO DMT. Um, and of course, uh, ayahuasca, which is DMT, uh, it's just DMT that's made orally accessible. Um, the The... The active ingredient is DMT, but the vine itself contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor that allows the DMT to be absorbed in the gut in a way that it normally would not be. Um, and and it's, in, it's interesting in the Amazon that although we know scientifically that the, the leaves that contain the DMT are the primary psychedelic ingredient, and although the ayahuasca vine is not supposed to be psychedelic particularly in itself, uh, in the Amazon, it is seen as the master plant. It is seen as the plant that has harnessed the other plant and drawn it uh, to this purpose of allow, uh, allowing people to have these experiences. And of course, Western scientists think that's all nonsense and rubbish, but that's another indigenous tradition that I think we need to respect. We're dealing with ancient teachers here, uh, and, and those, uh, those teachers may have been responsible for much more in the human story than we're presently allowed to imagine. Do you know how far back they were using... Um, I, well, from the from the cave art, uh, it's you know you often see headlines earliest evidence of psychedelic use. Uh, there's a cave in Spain, um, Selva Pascuala, which has uh, cl clearly identifiable imagery of of Psilocybe hispanica uh, alongside cave art. It's actually only about seven thousand years old. Um, there were some hair samples that were found recently which contained psychedelic residues about 3,000 years old, but that neither of those are the oldest evidence of psychedelic yeah. use. The oldest yeah. evidence, in my view, the clear, indisputable evidence, is the shamanistic art that we find all around the world, going back tens of thousands of years. In the case of, uh, in the case of Indonesia, there's art uh, with definite psychedelic influence, which is, which is going back 46 or 47,000 years. Uh, and I suspect it goes it goes further back than that. Humanity has been has been in a relationship with these medicines for for a very long time. So it we can't uh, you know I have to stick to what I can evidence and what I can and what I can evidence in my view and and in, certainly in the view of of Professor Lewis Williams in, in the University of Witwatersrand is that that evidence is in the art itself. This is psychedelic art mm -hmm. that we're looking at, uh, and and uh, therefore they they were having deeply altered states of consciousness and, and um, remembering what they'd seen and, 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 and painting it in visions. But it may go back much earlier than that. It's hard to, it's hard to know. Wow, wow. But certainly 40 plus yeah. thousand years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I have, sorry, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I know you said psychedelics should not, children should not use psychedelics. Yeah, definitely not. I have heard you talk about um, in certain cultures that even infants, newborns, yeah. are given ayahuasca. Yes, the Tucano in the Amazon will give a, a teaspoonful of ayahuasca to a newborn infant. Hmm. Um, and that's simply uh, a very early initiation. They're not going to have an ayahuasca journey. Right, right. But they're, they're, they're meeting uh, mother ayahuasca in some way. Hmm. And later in their lives, uh, ayahuasca plays a huge role in Tucano society. And later in their lives as, as, as adults, they will, they will have frequent ayahuasca journeys and they also will often paint their art or or create sand patterns in geometric shapes uh, you know showing 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 what they've seen so yes it, it, it has to be understood that it, that in the amazon rainforest ay ayahuasca is hugely respected yes um and enormously respected uh, a sa it's a sacrament it's 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 a sacred thing and it, and it and it's a it's a connection with the beyond with with the other whatever whatever that is um, whereas in our societies, we've been taught to demonize and despise these, these substances. And this is yet another area where we need to learn from indigenous societies. And um, as psychedelics 
are gradually gaining ground again in Western industrialized societies. If we're smart, we're going to sit down at the feet of indigenous shamans and learn from them. I'm not saying that the whole system of indigenous shamanism is ideal for Western society, but we can develop our own shamanism, but we have to learn from them first because they've been handling these substances for thousands of years mm -hmm. and they, they, they know how to manage difficult circumstances. Again, we enter an area where, where Western science just sneers because Western science is um, materialist reductionist in form, that everything, everything must be reduced to, to, to matter. Right. Um, but but uh, the, the um, experiences that we, that we have under psychedelics uh, cannot, be, cannot be reduced to matter. No. Uh, the encounters with entities, the teachings that we receive, the notion of Mother Ayahuasca. For me, it, she does appear to some some tribes in the Amazon do construe the spirit of Ayahuasca in male form, but the vast majority construe her as female in female form, and that's certainly the form that I've in, encountered her. And and you know, Western science just wants to write all of this off as kind of your brain fantasies. hallucinating. Yeah, fantasies. It's, it's just a hallucination. Like fantasies a dream. of the brain. Um, they need to go drink some Maya Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. come and back they, to me. <laughs> yeah, come back, and and they they might have a very very different view. Yeah, uh, you know our 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 prejudices do um, do orient us in some ways, but psychedelics have a way of busting through those prejudices and and showing us something that we never imagined that we would that we would see. For you, what has it done? Like, yeah. you've done quite a few sessions, and yeah, I know you've done sessions with you know the indigenous people down there and i know there's centers now I, th I think i actually ran across arrhythmia um, yeah arrhythmia is arrhythmia is a center in costa rica um there there, there are many many ways and, and it's largely westerners who, who right who go there um it, it's it's quite a luxurious resort yeah actually. yeah um and uh there's a there's a wonderful place in brazil called wasiwaska which is run by an old friend of mine dr luis eduardo luna he's an anthropologist um, he worked for years with Pablo Amaringo, who is one of the great ayahuasca artists. Um, Pablo has sadly has sadly passed away, um, but the the uh, ayahuasca journey that Luis uh, offers at Wasiwaska, uh, first of all, it's for a very small group of people, not more than ten. It's, I, I I'm not keen on sessions where a hundred people. Yeah, are. yeah, that seems. Uh, like it's, it's it's too yeah. difficult to control the space, and and this is what I wanted to say. I kind of lost my track, but I wanted to say about shamans is that one of the things that shamans are doing is they're controlling the energy of the space. Uh, when, we, when we encounter that other realm, and I need to say whatever it is, because we don't know what it is, uh, there is good out there, but there's also, there's also evil. There's, there's, there's stuff that wants to do you harm. And that's weird in itself. So the role of the shaman is to keep those negative influences at bay and protect the space and allow people to have a positive and, and worthwhile journey. And Western science would sneer at that, but that's precisely what we need to learn if we're going to handle psychedelics in a major way in Western societies. The space needs to be handled by people who know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people right now in the world who know what they're doing are shamans in indigenous societies. They know that better than anybody else. And we right. need to learn from them. It's very frustrating too that for so many people who want this experiment or experience and want to do it in the right way, it's not accessible for many people. It's hardly accessible at all. Or, or, or you, have, you see, you can go drink ayahuasca legally in Brazil because mm -hmm. it, it, it is regarded as a fundamental human right in Brazil. Right. Uh, ayahuasca is, is sacred and, and uh, Brazil respects that. Uh, and despite go, going through a rather, rather awful regime in Brazil in the, last, in the last few years, they carried on respecting that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you can't drink ayahuasca legally, uh, well, anywhere. Yeah. Else, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can drink it in Costa Rica. Costa Rica's made it legal as well. That's why that's why arrhythmia works. Um, but it's a it's a difficult thing. You have to you have to seek it out. First of all, first of all, the medicine will seek you out. You'll begin to feel a calling. This is something mm -hmm. this is something I need to do. And then you have to make the effort to figure out how and where can I do it. Well, yes, there are there are plenty of illegal ayahuasca ceremonies happening happening in America, and that's fine. I have no problem with that as long as they're well handled and the people who are delivering them are not, you know, simply drug dealers out right. to make money. Yeah. Right. The, this this is a sacred pursuit. This is a this is a this is an adventure into the the inner reaches of our own psyche. Mm -hmm. It's a very serious matter, 
and it needs to be handled properly. So the illegal situation that we have at the moment in Western technological societies prevents that from happening. It makes it, it, makes it something that's underground. And, yeah. it, and it makes it and it makes it something where there are individuals who can take advantage of it. Another thing I'd say to anybody who's who's drinking ayahuasca, because it does open the heart. You know, you you suddenly realize how beautiful everything is, and how and you yourself become fragile and vulnerable. So it may sound trivial, but my advice to anybody is don't do any kind of business deal within three weeks of an ayahuasca session. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> you're likely yeah. to give everything give away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, totally. um, you know, just learn, learn, from, learn mm. from the experience. It does make us vulnerable. And unfortunately, and I know some examples of this, I won't go into details, but I know some examples both in Britain and in America where people have exploited that vulnerability mm. of those who they've served ayahuasca to mm -hmm. in order to sell them stuff, other stuff. And and I'm I'm totally opposed to that. And we could that could be handled much better in a in a regime where where these substances are totally legal than in a regime where they're not legal. Right. And and you know the, again we can see the example of of uh, of cannabis in 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 Colorado. I mean, really high quality cannabis here. Yeah. You know, it's good stuff. <laughs> we're proud of it's it. It's really really good. <laughs> and and you know having to having to deal with with cannabis on the black market in Britain, you never quite know what you're getting. And right. Some of it, and and, and uh, particularly when you're talking about cannabis oils, you know, rather mm -hmm. than the right. light itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I like the fact that it's legal here, and that a serious effort has been put into ensuring that that what is offered to customers is of the highest possible quality and doesn't have shit in it that you don't want exactly in it. heavy metals and yeah, stuff in there. yeah yeah exactly exactly like. or cutting agents in it yeah, yeah that's right that's right so, so you know so that's that's where i would want to see everything go i'd want to see everything legalized and accompanying that legalization wise advice uh being given to people which will be taken seriously because that advice isn't coming from threatening figures like the police it's coming from people who know what they're doing who've, who've done the the journey many times and who understand what's in what's involved with it as many of you know out there, Kendall and I have three kitties on top of our dogs and rabbits. And one of the things that's absolutely driven me nuts over the years is the cat food I've been feeding them. For so long, it's been this low quality, nasty, sloppy, gravy-like consistency. But I've always been on the hunt for a better quality cat food that they will enjoy. I've tried a lot of different brands out there and for whatever reason, all my cats turn their noses up to everything out there except for Smalls. Smalls cat food is protein packed recipes made with preservative free ingredients you'd find in your fridge and it's delivered right to your door. Smalls was started back in 2017 by a couple of guys home cooking cat food in small batches for their friends. And today Smalls has served millions of meals to cats all across America. I switched all my dogs to more of a higher quality fresh dog food. And so I've been on the hunt for a better quality food for my cats and I'm so glad I finally found smalls i was skeptical at first if my cats would be into it because they're just so picky but they have been absolutely enjoying the, the different types of recipes there's like a cow recipe there's a bird recipe and there's also a fish recipe and they love all three of them after making the switch to smalls 78 percent of cat owners reported their cats had shinier and softer fur and 90% reported overall health improvements as my cats are getting older i want to make sure i'm feeding them the best quality food i can to help prolong their lives and keep them healthy. And I'm so glad Smalls has come into the picture and changed the game for cat food. The team at Smalls is so confident your cat will love their product that you can try it risk-free. That means they will refund you if your cat won't eat their food, which is always nice. Remember, higher quality ingredients mean a healthier and happier life for your kitty. So head to smalls.com slash milehire and use promo code milehire at checkout for 50% off your first order plus free shipping. That's the best offer you'll find, but you have to use our code MILEHIGHER for 50% off your first order. One last time, that's promo code MILEHIGHER for 50% off your first order plus free shipping. So I want to get into a little bit more in detail your ayahuasca experiences mm -hmm. and, and kind of talk to what, what it was like, you know, maybe some of the more profound experiences you've had in you know, there's always talk around entities, mm. you know, coming in contact mm -hmm. with entities and, you know, I like hearing, you know, Joe Rogan talk about his and he yeah. comes, you come in contact with something incredibly wise and powerful. Yeah. Is it God? Is it, you know, what is it? So I don't know. I don't know what she is. 
Um, and I speak specifically of ayahuasca there. It's interesting because DMT is the active ingredient in ayahuasca, but but smoked or vape DMT is is a radically different experience from ayahuasca. Yeah. First of all, it's very short. There are some crossovers at the level of geometry and 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 entities. There's times when when I've smoked DMT where I found myself back in the ayahuasca space, if only oh, if only, only mm. briefly. Um, there are crossovers, but by and large, it's very very different. Um, for me, the most important the most important issue with 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 ayahuasca has been has been as I mentioned earlier, dealing with my own baggage. I, I, have, um, I have a tendency to anger quickly. And when I get angry, I can say very hurtful things to other people. And I feel totally justified in saying it at the time. You know? yeah. Well, what ayahuasca has shown me is that that is really unhealthy behavior on my part and that I need to fix my anger problem. This is something I have to deal with. And, I have to, and, and it's not that drinking ayahuasca is just going to make it go away. I have, to con- I have to control how I act towards others and not express and not manifest anger because it causes so much pain. And when I do manifest anger, I feel so awful about it myself afterwards yeah. as well, you know. It's been, it's been, that, it's been teachings about, about how to be a more nurturing, more positive, more helpful human being. Um, and I'm not saying that I've achieved all of that. I'm a work in progress. But I'm grateful to Ayahuasca for giving me the insights about stuff I needed to fix. Um, I, have a, I have a problem feeling good about myself. Uh, I, I very often have this negative voice that con- I'm constantly running myself down, and I suspect many, many people yeah. have that voice. You know? I feel most people. Yeah, probably. I think most people. And, and one of my most memorable experiences with ayahuasca was where she took the form of a great serpent and wrapped herself around my body and laid this huge boa constrictor head on my, on my shoulder. Wow. And I was looking right into those eyes. And the message that came across was, love yourself. Learn to love yourself. Wow. Don't hate yourself. You can't be properly functional if you're in a state of self-hatred. And so again, there was an important message which, which taught me something that I needed to know and which I could, and which I could learn from. But perhaps the most, the most significant issue of all is this seamlessly convincing entry into another realm, which is not this realm. Yeah, We haven't got in a spaceship and gone there physically with mechanical means, but we have certainly gone to a place that is, I will use the word carefully, that is alien, that is a very different place. It's not the human world. We're going into something else and the entities we meet there uh, are very, very curious. And this then, this then raises more questions in the mind. What is reality? What right. is this thing that we yeah. define as real? You know, we... We're evolved to deal with the laws of physics and to function in a physical universe. We, we need to be able to function day to day in this universe. And if we are not able to function, the, the, this world will punish us very, very badly. But um, once we're locked into that, it's difficult to see that there might be much more to reality than that. Right. And that's one of the things that ayahuasca and the other psychedelics do, is that they open a doorway into other levels of reality. I use the word levels carefully. I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a matter of levels, other dimensions of reality, but realities that we do not normally encounter. And you know, everything that we encounter is an experience. If it's in this physical world and, and somebody you know, bumps into our car on the highway, that's an experience that we have, or we been bump into somebody. Else. That's an experience, and it's a real experience. Um, but fundamentally, it's an experience. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's true in the visionary journeys is that you're having experiences and it's wrong to dismiss them as unreal uh, simply because there isn't a physical coordinate for them. They're also experiences, they're valid experiences, and they may be amongst the most important experiences that we'll ever have in our lives. I think it's, I think it's tragic that, that so many people don't have the opportunity to have these experiences. Mm-hmm. In carefully controlled circumstances, I keep needing to emphasize this with people who know what they're doing. We don't call them shamans so much in the West. We call them facilitators. But there are some brilliant facilitators who've, you know, spent years sitting at the feet of shamans in the Amazon and learning from them and then coming back and offering ceremony. And those are the ones that we should seek out if we're looking for a a journey in Western technological societies where where ayahuasca remains illegal. Um, But undoubtedly, the the most practiced hands we will find ourselves in are those of shamans in the Amazon itself with, with ayahuasca. But this will change. It is, it is, it is changing. And, and as psychedelics are more and more 
embraced by our society and as and as science that which is the god of western civilization yeah you know really is. as science says actually you know what these are okay they're really helpful then that gives people permission to think more openly about them and perhaps to begin to make a journey that they would never they would never have made otherwise so it's that it's that feeling that that uh, i was living in a very confined and limited reality and i suddenly discover that reality is truly infinite and not just infinite in the sense of infinite physical space in in this physical universe but infinite across dimensions in all directions in every way depth width height infinite you in, know in all directions and directions that you can't weigh and measure and count directions that you can only experience this is uh, you know this is a fascinating fascinating thing and a, a point i i often make about this i went into it in depth in my in my 2005 book supernatural uh, is the is that different societies at different times will construe the encounters that take place in deeply altered states of consciousness in different ways according to what they're used to. Mm -hmm. So there there is a, a, an extraordinary similarity in the phenomenology uh, of uh, the experiences that shamans have with what they construe as spirits. Right the experiences that people right up until the 1950s uh, had with what they construed as fairies and elves, um, and uh, the experiences that are now being construed as encounters with aliens. Um, if you analyze the phenomenology and you compare them with reports of people who, who, for example, there's a very important study taking place at Imperial College in London right now, and I'm so glad that this is taking place. Uh, as as most people who are familiar with this subject know, DMT, smoked or vaped, is a very short journey. It, it, Ten minutes, really, is what it's about, sometimes less. And and what I describe it as is a rocket ship to the other yeah. side of reality. <laughs> Whoosh! You, know, you, you, you have to surrender. I mean, I mean yeah. it just takes you, takes you away. And then you find yourself in this, this very busy, extraordinary space where all kinds of stuff is happening and Entities are coming to you and you're seeing the geometry and the patterns and, and then you're back. Uh, what they're doing at Imperial College is they found a way to, to give volunteers um, extended release DMT. They're, they're, they're doing it effectively by drip straight into the bloodstream. Um, totally legal because it's a scientific uh, experiment and there's, there's more than 50 volunteers who've gone through this process. And I recently moderated a discussion with a colleague of mine, Andrew Gallimore, and with a number of the volunteers in the Imperial College study. And I know from that discussion and from many conversations that I've had with them subsequently, that, that the, their descriptions of the entities, first of all, are remarkably similar to one another, mm. and they weren't allowed to compare notes during the, during the uh, study. Uh, and secondly, are remarkably similar to what were construed as encounters with fairies and elves, and what are construed as encounters with aliens now, and what shamans construe as encounters with spirits. I think it's... It's all the same thing uh, being um, construed through different cultural spectacles. Uh, and this is something else that we need to study. This, these experiences have been with humanity forever. Um, and and um, it's hard to understand how they would be there, uh, how they would stay there, uh, if there wasn't something very important and worthwhile about them. Um, it's hard to explain in evolutionary terms. You know how 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 it is that the entire human race has the capacity to encounter entities who are part lion and part human in form, or part boa constrictor and part human in form, and impart teachings to us. It's really hard to understand how that could happen unless there's something absolutely real about those encounters. And I think that that we're just dipping our toes into the water of discovering what that is. A study is going to take place in Colorado, I believe, within the next year, possibly within the next six months it's going to start, where, again, another technology for extended-release DMT uh, is going to be given to volunteers here in Colorado, and I hope to be a volunteer myself yeah. Yeah, I was uh, say, in, that, look into this. in that in that, in, the, in that experience. Um, and this is, um, this is the, word, the, 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 the device that's being created that allows the, what well, they call it DMTX, um, has been invented by Andrew Gallimore uh, and Dr. Rick Strassman, uh, who's at the University of New Mexico. Rick Strassman wrote the book DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Right, yeah. He did the first research with human volunteers and DMT back in the 90s, and he's an absolutely key, 
crucial figure in this field and a very open-minded, very open-minded researcher who's, you know, done the, done the legwork, really done the work uh, to find out what is going on, to begin to explore. So just as important as the explorations that we wish to do of outer space and other planets, we need to be doing this kind of exploration yeah. as well. If we want to figure out who we are, I think actually this kind of exploration is more important mm -hmm. than sending human beings to, to the, Mars or to something. Mars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because yeah. actually, actually, we haven't grown up yet as a species. You know, I'm not sure we should be out there trying to colonize the universe right now. We've got to grow up first. Yeah. We've got to learn some lessons. And those lessons are available to us in deeply altered states of consciousness. And at the same time, uh, what what becomes open to us is the exploration of reality itself in yeah. all its immensity and all its dimensions. Psychedelics are really a gateway for that. Yeah, yeah they are. They are a gateway for that. Like, um, I know for me personally, psychedelics, I, I grew up in a very religious home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was sheltered most of my life. And so I, I, I only knew one, you know, sort of theory to mm -hmm. to the universe and mm -hmm. you know there's heaven hell there's god there's satan and so yep. it took me a long time to get rid of that dogma mm. and deconstruct and really deconstruct yeah. all of those yeah. ideas because it's drummed into us from yeah. you know day one yeah. and that's so many people too i mean that's so like the majority people. of the yeah, planet vast, vast majority of the planet whatever religion they follow it's drummed into them from day one and these are hierarchical religions yeah, yeah. uh often with a rather unpleasant entity sitting at the top of the hierarchy yeah exactly you know, yeah. when you get down to you get down to grips with it i mean these, are, these of course are heretical things to say if you Hundred years ago, people got burnt at the stake. Yeah, like yeah. we'd all but, be dead. <laughs> but who did they get burnt at the stake by? They got right. burnt at the stake by mainstream religion. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so, so um, by the way, I want to name check um, Jacques Vallée when I talked about fairies and elves and encounters with fairies and elves being so similar uh, to shamanistic encounters with spirits and and um, modern encounters with with so called aliens. Uh, Jacques Vallée was the first to recognize the fairy and elf connection. He wrote an amazing book back, back in the 60s. Unfortunately, Jacques Vallée is still with us, and he's a brilliant researcher, and his book was called Passport to Magonia. Mm. Mm. And he's the first researcher who really showed that the experiences that we have under psychedelics are closely linked to experiences that people were reporting of encounters with fairies and elves. And, and I would recommend everybody to go read Passport to Magonia and read Rick Strassman's DMT, The Spirit Molecule key spirit too and mm. i think like one of the things that i've really learned from because for when i left religion i was i was very angry and mm -hmm. i kind of called myself an atheist for a while mm -hmm. just in spite but then i reconnected with my spirituality through yeah. the use of psychedelics because yeah. it really showed me that this is a spiritual mm -hmm. realm that we're yeah. in it's all Absolutely. around us yeah. and yeah. and that gave me so much hope and it's it's something uh you know and that's why i'm hoping to one day have a visit with mother ayahuasca because mm. i really want to connect deeper yeah. on that spiritual aspect yeah. can yeah. you talk about how spirituality kind of plays into well all first this? Of, first of all it's important to be clear that religion and spirituality are two different things correct yeah, yeah. that's yeah. absolutely yeah. important. Re re religion is fundamentally a dogma uh and and, and a teaching which is delivered by so-called experts in that teaching uh spirituality is is your personal experience of living of living in the world and and uh how the world impacts you and how you impact the world. And do you do so in an entirely material way as you're focused totally on buying stuff and defining yourself in terms of what you own and what you earn and your possessions, which is what our society wants it to be? Or is there some deeper level? And spirituality is recognizing that deeper level, that it's, uh, that it's a key part of being human. Um, and it's important. I, uh, I also rebelled against Christianity. Um, I, I was brought up in a Christian family. My rebellion began um, in, my, in my early teens when I was at a school that forced me to kneel in chapel oh, wow. to say yeah. prayers. And, I, and I, I took a decision that I will not kneel. Uh, I, I refused to kneel. Um, and that led me on a journey where by the time I was 17 or 18, I absolutely defined myself as an atheist. There is no God. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what atheist means. It means without God, literally. But it doesn't mean without spirit. You know, we don't need the old guy with the beard in the clouds uh, threatening to beat us up, uh, to have a spiritual experience. Uh, mm -hmm. On the contrary, that entity is likely to get in the way of a spiritual experience. Very important to, uh, a lot of people are not aware of, of Gnosticism, which yeah. was an alternative to Christianity. Right. It was a 
alternative form of Christianity in the early days. It precedes Christianity in many ways. But um, you know, the Gnostics had a had a very a very different attitude to that entity that we've been taught to call Yahweh or Jehovah. Right. Uh, from the Gnostic point of view, that entity was a demon, and his purpose was to mislead the human race and to prevent us from what the universe has gifted us, this amazing planet and these colossal opportunities to learn and grow and develop. And amongst those opportunities, it is necessary for us to be able to distinguish between good and evil. It's necessary for us to be able to understand that distinction. And it's interesting that in the Garden of Eden, the entity called Yahweh is furious with Adam and Eve because they eat of the tree of knowledge right. of good and evil. Yeah. You know, it's, it, that's the first thing we have to have. If we're, going, if we're not just going to be these meat robots, unthinking entities that consume and produce and do nothing else, we have to be able to make informed choices in these, in these areas. And, and from the Gnostic point of view, the, the serpent in the Garden of Eden was the good guy. And I know somebody's going to get very angry yeah. <laughs> at saying this, but I'm, I'm simply reporting what the Gnostics themselves believe, that the serpent was bringing knowledge to Adam and Eve. And, and um, I, I've, I've quoted this several times, but there's this eerie passage in, in the book of Genesis um, where, where the entity, the demiurge, as the Gnostics saw him, called Yahweh, is going to drive Adam and Eve out of the garden because they've eaten of the right. tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. And, and then there's this very bizarre passage where that entity says, lest they discover the tree of life and become gods like us. You know, mm. Who are those? Who is that us? What is, what is this? It's as though something that was meant to be edited out of the text kind of crept back in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, in 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 a way, so let's never confuse spirituality and 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 religion. I'm not saying that it's impossible for people within religions with p profound religious beliefs to have spiritual experiences. Of course they can. Spirituality is the is the, the inheritance of all humanity. Yeah. Um. But but the two should not be should not be confused. Uh. And and spirituality is uh, much more fundamental than religion. It's much more basic. Be, to being a human being and it's and, more freeing too it's allowing you to experience it in yes. your own way yeah, yeah. and you're not because that, that's the thing with religion is it's just you're following rules and yes you have to live by the yeah. holy book otherwise yeah. 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 you're not following in god's yes you know, and you're going to be condemned by your community and, yeah. and and in some cultures if you don't follow those rules they will kill you yeah as they as they used to do in western society up until the 18th century the last witch burnings in britain were about 1750 you know it's not that long ago and forget questioning anything. That and then that's yeah. where I kind of I got to a point where I was actually down in Costa Rica um, doing a mission trip, and mm -hmm. I remember this night. I, everybody was literally singing "Kumbaya" mm -hmm. uh, during mm -hmm. like a worship service, <laughs> mm -hmm. and there was a lightning storm. And I just remember I, I looked up at the sky and I saw like a a lightning bolt go across, and I just had this. It was almost like this awakening that happened, where I was like, "What am I doing here? This mm -hmm. is such a." strange cult-like experience yeah, i'm in yeah i want to break free from this yeah. and pursue my own yeah. journey and without all of this absolutely and that's what's that's what's needed that's what that's what humanity humanity needs yeah we need much less so-called leadership yeah i'm not sure we need leaders at all but we need leaders while people are while people have been schooled into not thinking for themselves that's what makes leaders yeah. necessary right the two things are the opposite sides of the same coin once people start thinking for themselves, they don't need leaders anymore. They don't need to be told what to think. They don't need to be told how to function. And um, yes, I mean, there's a role for administrators in a complex society. Right. But the person who says, I'm a leader, I'm going to lead you, I'm going to tell you what to think, yeah. that's a wrong step. Well, especially those that claim to have a connection with the divine. Even worse. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. even worse. And it often and leads, you don't, I do. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it often leads to disastrous results uh, in, in, in that case. Uh, so, you know, we don't need leaders. We need to be our own leaders uh, in, in the future. And it's good that you had that realization in the way, in the way that you did. And then psychedelics just help break down, because it's like to be indoctrinated in that way for, you know, the first 18 years of my life. I mean, that's really hard to just, shed yeah. right yeah. you have to work through it i mean even now i still have times where i'm like am i living my life the wrong way am mm -hmm. i 
is the devil leading me sure. down this road? Sure. Sure. And but whenever I do psychedelics, it really helps just break, allow me to break free from yeah. all of that and yeah. look at things from such a clear point of view mm -hmm. where it's like, this is so much more complex and divine than I even know. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just thankful to be alive and yes. having this experience. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's what's so beautiful. Yeah. About yeah. It. And that's yeah. why our leaders don't want the majority of people to have it. That's exactly They're why. That's exactly why they don't want that they don't want people to have it. And and the, the realization that comes of the enchanted beauty of the world in which we live. Yeah. And and the magic that's there. Another word that science sneers at. But we we live in a magical universe. And and um, and it's important to reconnect with that magic, and it's important to reconnect with with spirit, uh, because it's precisely the disconnection with spirit which which is leading our cultures on the road to disaster, uh, and that reconnection with spirit will not be offered by any of the mainstream religions. It is possible for somebody who's a member of one of those religions to reconnect with spirit, but the religion itself is most unlikely to help. Do you have hope? for humanity that we can reconnect with spirit? Yes, I do. I have, I have, I have great hope for humanity. I think that, um, well, by the very fact that humanity is still here. That's um, true. <laughs> we got that going for us. <clears throat> because, you, you know, uh, uh, evolution on this planet is a tough, is a tough business. And, and um, you don't get to stay if, 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 you, if you've not been doing some things right. Uh, I, think that, I think that fundamentally, when I go around the world, and I've been privileged to travel incredibly wi widely all, all my working life. What I see first and foremost is that despite superficial differences, all human beings everywhere uh, are fundamentally the same. We all have the same hopes, the same fears, the same ambitions. We all love our children in the same way and want to, to give them the best start in life. We're all capable of love. We all give love. We all need love. It doesn't matter you know, whether you're in some some remote settlement in the middle of a of jungle or whether or whether you're in the middle of downtown denver it doesn't matter we're all the same we're all the same people and what's fundamental to human beings is the capacity to love the capacity yeah. to receive love and to give love this is the most important thing a life without love in it where no love is given and no love is received is a barren and empty life uh and and that is that to me is 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 a key aspect of all human beings now, there are other aspects, of course, uh, precisely because we evolved in a very competitive situation. Uh, there, there is the, the, the desire to compete against others. We have, we have leaders like uh, Vladimir Putin who are you, you know, willing to, or Hitler back in the day, are just willing to invade other people's countries, just take them over, impose upon them. There's a lot of wickedness in human beings too. Um, and, and we can see that at, 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 at a very large level in terms of the relationship between states, and we can see it at a very small level in terms of the relationships between individual human beings. But I am confident that love far outweighs hatred and fear and suspicion. Love far outweighs that all, uh, and in the long run, that is what is going to prevail. That is what is going to come through. That is our, that is our fundamental survival ability is the ability to love one another and, and to cooperate in a nurturing and positive way with one another. It is not our fundamental ability to fight one another and kill one another, mm -hmm. which is something else that human beings also do. But I think it, the chance is there if, if we don't destroy our world in one way or another and uh, you know, become as gone as the dinosaurs, Although they're not quite gone because right. chickens are dinosaurs, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is true. you know, but they are gone. Um, and and indeed, we as mammals could not have evolved in the way we did if the dinosaurs hadn't been swept out of the way by that comet or asteroid impact sixty six million years ago. Um, we face many threats as a human community worldwide, uh, and the best way to solve those threats is is to cooperate uh, and to recognize that we have far more in common with each other right. than what differentiates us from each other. I'm not saying that everybody should be packed into a, a, a sort of universal standard mode. I love the beauty of different cultures and the variety at, that, that, that comes from different cultures all around the world. But at heart, all human beings share the same hopes, the same needs, the same dreams, the same fears, and the same capacity for love. And it's that capacity for love that will save us. Hearing you say that gives me so much hope, 
as an American, especially because right now our country is so deeply divided yeah. and there's so much violence and so much hatred mm. that it sometimes feels hopeless. And I feel very depressed, especially but, now being a mother. Yeah. I'm worried about the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And really, I'm, a, I'm a grandparent of eight grandchildren. You know, yeah. It's six, amazing. Six, 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 six children. And I, I have those concerns too. I want to see... I want to see my grandchildren grow up into a, into a positive world where yeah. they will have the opportunity to explore their gifts and, and and learn what to do and where nobody's gonna you know hurt them just needlessly and unnecessary because of some random idea it's ideas that drive people mad in many ways many of yeah. these wars that take place that get down at root is there's a very bad idea at the root of it that some charismatic person has been able to present mm -hmm. the darkest hour comes just before the dawn it is the, an old saying and um, I think it's true. Yes, there's a great deal of division in America today. Yes, there's a great deal of Britain, uh, division in Britain today. Britain is a very divided country over, over many issues. And countries are divided amongst themselves. You know, we have this horrific war in Ukraine. Um, there's there's the, the prospect of, of nuclear war hovering over us at, 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 at any time. It is a rather dismal prospect as a parent, as a grandparent, to it see is. us going down that route. And, and to see messages being beamed out that manipulate fear and hatred and suspicion, right. and that use those, that mobilize those, that yeah. weaponize those to divide people from one another. Um, but I come back to the basics. We are creatures who have an enormous capacity for love. And love fundamentally is giving. It's, it's giving to the other person, not taking from them. Uh, and that capacity that we have is what is going to save us. And I remain completely optimistic and positive about that. That that's, makes me feel a lot better because I've been here. feeling Well, it seems like love negative. transcends this reality as yes. well. Yeah. Yeah. And from, I'm sure from your experiences with ayahuasca and other psychedelics, that's like one of the reoccurring themes I think you experience is like that it, it, this does, isn't just here on earth. This mm. is throughout the entire universe. I believe so. And all other dimensions and yeah. all other entities, there is, you know, there's good and evil, but... Yeah. Love is the prevailing. Love is the, love is the prevailing thing, and yeah. and 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 the fact that the fact that good and evil exist um, does give us the opportunity to grow by the choices that we make. We define right. ourselves by the choices that we make. And if we choose evil, that's the choice we've made. And if you go into many of the much of the ancient wisdom on this, you'll you'll you will find, and this this is true of the mainstream religions too, that there will be an accounting sooner or later. Um, it's very it's very clear in the ancient Egyptian texts um, and, in, and, and in Gnosticism, that you were given this incredible opportunity to be born in a human body. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is no light thing. The, we could not be here if the whole physical universe were not here. If every distant planet and every distant star were not here, we would not be here. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that we're what it's all about. I think the universe is probably, is probably full of life, but what an opportunity to be born in a human body, to have this level of consciousness where we can make discerning choices between the right path and the wrong path, rather than having those choices laid out for us and made for us in advance. And in the process of making those choices, we learn and we grow and we develop. I happen to believe in reincarnation. I can't prove it. Scientists will scoff at me. Uh, but uh, to me, it makes, a great deal of, it makes a great deal of sense. I'll recommend another uh, very important book by um, Professor Ian Stevenson, Children Who Remember Past Lives. Mm. Um, and he, mm -hmm. he worked largely with children in India. Our culture discourages children from remembering past lives. It thinks they're fantasizing when they talk about it. But very often, children up to the age of seven will have distinct and clear memories of past lives. We discourage it. In India, they don't. And, and in a very scientific way, he was able to document uh, those memories. So a, a, a child of five would remember a previous life in another village, would remember the name of that village, Great turned detail. out to be hundreds and hundreds of miles away, mm -hmm. would remember that, that he or she had concealed something under the eaves of a particular hut. And lo and behold, when they went to that hut, there it was. They find it. You yeah. know? So to, to me, it's as reasonable as anything else. It's, 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 it's as extraordinary to be born once as to be born multiple times. And, um, the point, I think the point of it is, for me, this earth, this physical realm, this incarnation that we're living is, I call it a theater of experience. We're here to learn and to grow and to develop. And ideally, we should, we should leave it 
um, having been positive and useful people to those around us, not spreading hatred and fear, but giving love in, in every possible way. And that way, the next stage of our journey is likely to be, to be better. Or we may need to keep coming back and having that, that journey again and again. As mm-hmm. I say, I cannot prove this scientifically. It may be complete nonsense, um, but it makes, sen- it makes sense to me. And, and um, this, this says that there's some purpose of why, why is the universe invested in, in creating something like planet Earth in the first place? where humans may have these, these experiences and make these choices uh, if we're not being given an incredible opportunity. And we should be grateful for that opportunity from every minute that we're alive. We should be grateful for it and we should make the most of it. And making the most of it doesn't mean buying the next hot car. Right. You know, yeah. making, making the most of it means developing ourselves spiritually in such a way that we are nurturing and positive presences to others. And we begin to get some insight into the much bigger picture that we're a small part of. So we were just talking off camera a little bit about cannabis. Mm -hmm. And I related a lot to your journey because I know for many years you used cannabis Mm. seven days a week, 16 hours a day. I've heard you say that. Well, when I'm writing. Okay. um, To to be clear, my my relationship with cannabis is is a curious one in the sense that although I did encounter it in my early 20s, it didn't particularly draw me and I didn't have much to do with cannabis until I was 37 or mm. 38 years old. Mm. Um, and then I was regularly visiting a country that's played a very important role in my life, certainly at that time, and that was Somalia in East Africa. And I had a friend there who was deeply into cannabis. At the same time, I had a new friend in England who was deeply into cannabis. And they both kind of turned me on to cannabis. Around about 1987, uh, 37 years old is, is quite, quite old to discover the magic of cannabis, but, yeah. but I did. And, and I found it suited me. I found it suited me very well. Initially, I didn't believe I could write, uh, using cannabis. Mm-hmm. And so therefore what I would do is I would, I would smoke cannabis at that time of an evening, um, when I was, when I'd stopped writing and I was ready to go to bed. But then when it came to writing Fingerprints of the Gods, and I guarantee you my critics are going, oh, yeah. going to use <laughs> Hold this that. against me. Yeah, yeah. Of course. When it came to writing every single word in Fingerprints of the Gods, and there's about 180,000 of those words, every single one was written in stone. Mm. Um, I was vaping cannabis right from the beginning to the, to, to, to the end. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I began to experiment. I, and, and as I say, initially I didn't think I could write with it. And then I thought I'd experiment. You see... For me, writing is indeed a, a seven day a week. When I, when I get that down to writing a book, there's a whole range of things involved in creating a book and, and uh, there's an enormous amount of research reading to do. Uh, there's, in the case of my books, there's an enormous amount of travel to do. Uh, and then there's the writing to do. And I try to do the bulk, I will discover new things while I'm writing, but the bulk of the research I try to do first, get that out of the way, make myself completely familiar with the literature bulk of the travels, unless I discover that there's somewhere else I need to get to while I'm actually writing the book, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down for a year or more than a year sometimes, and I'm going to literally work seven days a week and often 16 hours a day um, writing. And uh, that creates physical boredom. Just as sitting in this chair long enough becomes physically boring, your legs get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, sitting in my chair in front of my computer, gazing at that screen 16 hours a day, um, interesting things are going on in my mind, but at the level of my body, it's kind of uncomfortable. Cannabis helped that a lot. Yeah. It just, and and it it made it, it made it a more attractive experience to me. Um, So, so it rapidly became my habit to, to use cannabis continuously while writing. Um, and, uh, and I still do, uh, I think that different people have different reactions to cannabis. Uh, and in my case, um, it doesn't certainly use during the day while I'm writing. It doesn't make me drowsy, sleepy. It doesn't, I don't take my eye off the ball. I remain focused. Um, and, and, uh, I do think that it, that it frees up some connections sometimes that I, that I have insights that I perhaps wouldn't, wouldn't have otherwise. But fundamentally, it, it, it's an enjoyable experience yeah. uh, while I'm doing what is really quite, it doesn't, may not seem to, to others, but sitting in a chair for 16 hours a day is physical work. 
Uh, and while I'm doing that, uh, cannabis helps me helps me along. So I had a long relationship with with cannabis as a as a writer, and then. And then in two, I think it was roughly 2010 or 2011, I forget exactly, I, was, I, was, um, I did a series of ayahuasca sessions in, in Brazil, and, and uh, the entity that I construe as Mother Ayahuasca uh, came to me full on and, and showed me my cannabis habit and said, this is not serving you. Mm. You, have to, you have to stop this. Um, because I'd, in a way, I'd become a bit of a servant of, of, of cannabis in that sense the insight was correct and it was um it was it was a powerful experience and that that experience led me to quit cannabis for for three years and i did continue to write books i wrote some novels during those those three years so i thought i can write without cannabis i yeah. just enjoy writing more with it right <laughs> right and um it was the wonderful joe rogan who turned me back on yes, yes. i love that episode <laughs> you know because he he asked me that question you know are you thinking about cannabis again after after three years? And I said, well, yeah, maybe I'll dip my toes back in the water. And He's like, here you go. Dipping <laughs> the toes now, right yeah. now. <laughs> and, uh, you held it together really well. Yeah. After all that time. That yeah, really I, I, I played that episode back and I, I did manage to kind of hold it together. You know, as yeah. everybody knows, there, there are short-term memory issues with cannabis. You, mm -hmm. can, yeah. you mm -hmm. can lose your track. You can be launched on this long statement oh, and suddenly totally. forget what the hell you thought. <laughs> <laughs> You know, kind of, kind of embarrassing, but I did, I did hold it together. I, I couldn't drive myself home. Mm -hmm. um, Santa had to come and pick me up. Um, <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and and because uh, I, I wasn't, I wasn't safe to drive. But mm -hmm. so th then I thought, well, actually, that was fun, and and um, I'm going to reengage with with cannabis, and I have, I have reengaged with it uh, ever ever since. Um, it's important. It's important to me. It's an important medicine for me. Mm -hmm. It may also be. It may also be a very a very helpful medicine. For, for me, uh, in terms of physical ailments, because because um, I I discovered late in life that I I suffer from epilepsy, mm. uh, and mm -hmm. and cannabis is actually very helpful in keeping it epileptic is. fits down. And um, I don't think it's an accident that I, that at the time when I had a truly massive epileptic seizure that put me in an induced coma for forty eight hours. That actually, for the two weeks prior to that, I hadn't had any cannabis. Oh wow! Mm. Um, I think I think the cannabis is is definitely helpful, and there's medical research that shows that cannabis yes. is helpful for epilepsy. Absolutely. Yeah, they prescribe it cannabis oil. Yeah, ex uh, exactly. For... And and this is one area where thank thankfully you know Britain has taken a tentative step forward, mm. and and it would be possible for me to get my cannabis prescribed because of my epilepsy. I'm I. I I just detest bureaucracies, and 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 I've kind of avoided that. But yeah. maybe I'll go that way at some at some time in the future. I'm 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 not I'm not sure. But for me, it's a very it's a very helpful medicine. And yes, there are these anxious moments and 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 you know par paranoid thoughts that come in. But by and large, not by and large, it's a happy medicine, uh, and it's also a sensual medicine. Uh, we enjoy food, we enjoy music, we enjoy making love better. Absolutely, yeah. most human beings. Yeah, I yeah. certainly do. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing in, in, in that way. And, uh, and it doesn't make us crazy and irresponsible and nuts at all. Uh, or violent. Most or of the time. Yeah. Far from it. Yeah. Alcohol right. makes people violent or, or certainly it, it unleashes the violent potential within them. Uh, but cannabis does, does not, you know, if I had to choose between being driven home by somebody who was stoned on cannabis or drunk on alcohol, I'd definitely go for the cannabis. Absolutely. Driver. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that anybody should right. drive stone on <laughs> cannabis, course. yeah. But a, a, a stone cannabis driver tends to be very slow and very mm -hmm. careful. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, whereas a drunk driver is rash and stupid and will take unnecessary risks. Yes. Um, I, I don't. I don't see. I, I do see again the propaganda war being reeled out and, and trying to suggest that cannabis is connected in some way to, to negative and violent behavior. But I don't see that. Mm -mm. I don't see that. I don't see that anywhere. And, mm -hmm. and, and if it does bring out negative behavior in somebody, that behavior was there already. It's not yeah. caused by the cannabis. Yeah. 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 For so long, cannabis was a medicine for me. For yeah. Physical, mental, you know, mm. across the board. Mm. Um, I used it every single day for years. Yeah. And then I stopped. Mm -hmm. It was no longer serving me. Mm -hmm. And now I miss it a lot. Mm -hmm. And I want to start again. Yeah. But every time I've kind of jumped back in, I start to get that anxiety and paranoia okay. and I don't know how to break past that or if I'm experimenting with the wrong strain or who knows there's just more experimentation and, yeah. and you'll find out but but at the end of the day if something is any substance is making us feel uncomfortable yeah. unhappy 
stressed out, maybe it's not a good idea to do it. You know, yeah. everybody's different. Everybody's different in the way they respond to these to these medicines. Um, and and um, if if I felt again that cannabis wasn't serving me, I would I would stop it. Yeah. But right now it works. It works for me. And you know, as we get into older age, this is one of the the the, the tragedies of the, the you know old people's homes. Of course, you have them here in the United States. We yeah. have them in Britain. I saw my yeah. my mother became unable to look after herself and had to go into a an, an old people's home. Um, our house, which is tall and narrow and full of stairs, was not was not suitable for her. What a miserable experience that yeah. that, that she had. Truly and how, depressing. I'm not sure she would ever have, have crossed the the bridge into actually consuming cannabis. I, I I think she was she was too much yeah affected by the propaganda. Yeah, right, right. but but cannabis could be one of those ways to make the passage of time in old people's homes much better than it is Absolutely. at present. And mm-hmm. and you know, fortunately, some work is now being done with psychedelics and the elderly who may be in the last year of life. So on. This is a very, you know, we're all going to we're all going to come to that point in life. A lot of a lot of younger people don't realize this. I didn't realize this when I was in my twenties or thirties. But the years pass very fast, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, your mind may be alert and young, but your body gets your body gets older. And at a certain point, your ability to care for yourself and look after yourself uh, gets less. Your friends die off. Your your you you may or may not have support from your family. Uh, I think these medicines can be very helpful in that mm-hmm. in that situation, um, and I would uh, well. I hope I never end up in an old people's home. They're I know, mis- miserable oh, and horrible places. It is. It's horrible. Um, but but work is being done uh, into looking at um, creating uh, care homes where um, psychedelics will be the central feature, and that everybody staffing that care home will be a person who's deeply experienced in facilitating. Uh, psychedelic journeys. Um, there's a wonderful lady in England called Amanda Fielding, who she's in her 80s herself, who runs uh, the Beckley Foundation, which has been involved in financing a lot of the research that's now being done on psychedelics. And she's very interested in, in looking to see whether there's a way that psychedelics can be delivered to the elderly in, in care homes and, and cannabis. They, they, these should be available, uh, rather than the miserable regime that we have at the moment in these in these places, loneliness, the loneliness, the boredom, yeah, all of those things could be ameliorated very significantly. Yeah, it's it's such a shame that so many, you know, the end of their life ends in that way. Yeah, and when you have there's access to substances that could provide a uplifting, yes, almost spiritual experience absolutely. right before you, yeah, abs- 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 you transition. Abs- absolutely, which lead us into that lead us into that journey, and that's what I I think death is. I think it's the next great adventure. I think it's the next. The next journey that we're going to have after, after this, and and our society pays almost no attention to it, yep. shoves it off to the side, which is Something, crazy because it's been used for thousands of years. Yeah. I mean, I know in your your research, going all the way back to the ancient Egyptians, Ooh. and if you look at the Book of the Dead, and you look at the yeah. lotus and all of these different things, like they were clear that was clearly a part of of their society. Oh, to- totally, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A, a, a lot of people wrongly think that the ancient Egyptians were obsessed with death, but what they were obsessed with was life and how to live it right. Yeah. So that so that you can have a good death rather than a bad death. Um and and uh you know these 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 medicines which have been so neglected by our society can play a very important role in that. And this is this is a, a very important issue. There are millions and millions of lonely elderly people who are ending up in old people's homes and who, no matter how caring and good the staff may be, they're not getting the benefits that they would get if, they, if, they, if psychedelics and cannabis were available to them. I'm not saying they have to take yeah, it. Yeah, like, you know, force it's not, it on them. It's, yeah. not, it's not required, but if you feel the calling and it might help you, here it is. And here's the wise advice that surrounds it. And here's a person who really knows how to control the set and the setting of the person who's going into that experience to help that person. This is the next step forward that 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 is that is needed in this in this area. I always think, and and I'm sure you can talk to this more. I always wonder at the end of my life, am I going to feel at peace about what's coming next, or am I going to be in a state of constant fear and anxiety? And I'm sure there's people that experience both. But yeah. I think I think it depends on. I think it depends on how good you feel about your life. It, it fund, fundamentally comes down to it. Such sounds almost trivial, but. 
when you weigh it all up in the balance, was I a good person or yeah. was I a negative person? Mm -hmm. And if you're ruthlessly honest with yourself and you see so many negative acts that you consciously indulged in during your life, I think you're going to have a bad day. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you feel that you've made your best effort, everybody's frail and fragile. We all make mistakes. We're all capable of being horrible to other people and, and, and of not being nurturing and caring. But life is a certain number of years, might be 70 might be 90, might be less, you know, nobody, it's all random. We're all standing right next to the doorway of death. I don't mean to be gloomy, <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. life is incredibly fragile yeah. and it can be lost at any, at, at, at any moment. And when that, when that moment comes, I think it's much better to be in a situation where you're at peace with the life you've lived. Yes, I made mistakes. Yes, I did this wrong, but I learned from those mistakes. I tried not to repeat them. I tried to be a positive and helpful person. If that's been your journey, then I think death is, is going to be a positive continuation of that, of that journey. Personally, I don't fear death. Mm. I'm rather interested in it. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens. Yeah. It's, I'm curious about it. Uh, what I fear is pain mm. and humiliation and uh, the no longer having the ability to, uh, to look after myself, you know, becoming dependent. I don't want to be dependent. I, and I don't want to. I don't want to endure years of horrific pain. Um, you know, again, this is a this is a, a touchy subject. But I, I I like to think that I might choose to check out at a certain point, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If if my life was no longer no longer serving me. But then there's part of me that says, well, maybe that's maybe that's not what you should do because maybe part of your journey is to undergo that pain, right? And 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 to learn from that as well. So I'm not I'm not absolutely clear on that. But yeah. what the the misery that I've seen in old people's homes, the misery of my mum, my mum and her and her mm -hmm. passing mm -hmm. and what she and what she went through, uh, really had a, a searing effect effect on me. Um, and I I know that uh, our society is not looking after this issue well, and it's an issue that confronts every one of us sooner or later. Um, and we should be paying much more, much more attention to it and making it a beautiful thing, a thing to be celebrated in a way, rather than, rather than a thing to have a horror and a fear of. Yeah, that's a really great way to put it. I was going to ask you, because I just, I'm so curious, throughout your life, and, and maybe just in general, what do you make of the paranormal when it comes to, you know, people seeing apparitions of, of, of perhaps their loved ones mm. or locations that are haunted? Like, what do you make of, of that whole world? I think we should take it very seriously. Uh, I think, uh, again, this is an area where we can learn from in indigenous cultures around the world for whom what we call the paranormal is the normal. Mm. It's just part of life. Yeah, it's always it's, been here. It's always it's been a always, part of this It's experience. always been a part of life. And, and in encounters with, with deceased relatives, um, these, these can be very important. We often don't have closure. With, with somebody close to us who's, who's passed. And the opportunity, whether just by the way the universe works or through psych taking psychedelics that we may have encounters with deceased relatives is, is, uh, is very important. I, I think that we need, to we need to broaden our definition of what is normal and yeah. what is real. Yeah. Uh, and we need to allow into it lots of things that materialist reductionist scientists don't want to see in there. Uh, these experiences have been, have been part of the human story since the beginning, uh, and and they cannot, you know, you know, science cannot write them off as as complete trash, uh, just because it can't weigh or measure or count them. Uh, they're they're a fundamental part of human experience, and we should we should value them, and we should and we should learn from them, not not sneer at them. So uh, it's all part of this of of this realization that we live in a much broader reality than 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 we imagine, and that and that reality definitely can include the deceased. Um, I, I think death is a veil, but there's something beyond that veil. I, I don't believe that it all ends with the death of our physical body. And again, I have to emphasize, I can't prove that. Nobody can. But I don't believe it ends with the death of our... I think physical body is a vehicle uh, that we have to maneuver in this, in this physical realm that gives us the opportunity to learn the lessons that this realm has to teach. Um, but fundamentally, our consciousness uh, is incarnated in this body not made by this body. And therefore, when this body ceases to function, our consciousness continues. 
uh, in another state, in another in another realm, perhaps. Who knows? But but it but continues. And then there's this whole question of reincarnation and coming back. Mm. It's a great mystery. Yeah, it's a great mystery. And 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 amongst the many mysteries that science is addressing itself to, the issue the these issues need to be explored uh, as as well. But science, unfortunately, lacks the lacks the mental framework to explore the mystery of death and the mystery of apparitions and the mystery of the so-called paranormal, which is just really all it requires is, is understanding that the normal is a much bigger thing than we think it is. And these are perfectly normal human experiences. Well, it seems like science wants to put everything in a box. Too. In a box. Yeah. Everything is in a box. It's yeah. like, when are we going to move beyond the box? It's most unfortunate that science yeah. has gone in that direction because you only need to go back a generation or so and you'll find much more open-minded scientists yeah, than yeah. you find today yeah. it's a it's a kind of modern modern a modern phenomenon and a modern arrogance yeah the arrogance is just what's so unsettling yeah. to me you know that they think they've got all the tools and all the knowledge and all the insight to just explain everything uh and and no they don't not 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 at all um and and uh, much much more work needs to be done in fact the work will never be never be completed no, no. right uh, because that's also part of being alive and being a human being is the is the mystery of of, of all things we we don't know. We don't know what the deal is. The Greeks had this notion that, that, that when you pass through the veil of death and you're going to come back, you drink of the waters of forgetfulness. Uh, and, and you, <laughs> yeah. you, because if you remembered everything about past lives, you wouldn't be able to play the game of this life straight. You'd know what the deal is. Yeah. Whereas it's that, it's that uncertainty which, which is actually very, very helpful in this respect. Uh, we can't be sure what the stakes are. We could just be meat robots. It's possible. Mm -hmm. You know, it could just blink out and be gone, and there's just nothing else. It could be that. I don't think it is that. I'm sure mm -hmm. it's not that, but I can't prove it. Um, and nor can, nor, can, nor can a scientist who's deeply committed to the materialist reductionist model prove that there is no life after death. Like, on, on the contrary, the anecdotal evidence far outweighs uh, the, the, in the direction of there being uh, conscious survival of death. There's a huge amount of anecdotal evidence for that. And just because the physical body dies, we don't know what's happened, what's happened to consciousness. It's, it's one of the, you know, the greatest mysteries of science. Well, we don't even know where consciousness originates from, where it lies within no. the body while no. you're alive. No. I mean, yeah. that's I mean, it's other... clearly, it, it clearly involves the brain in some way, yeah. but exactly how it involves it is not at all clear. Um, and I, I prefer the notion um, of, of the brain as a, as a receiver or a transceiver of consciousness rather than as a, man, a manufacturer right. of consciousness. Right. Um, that, that's, that's my, my own view of it. And we have, to, you know, we have to make up our own minds about these things that we go yeah. through life from the, from the experiences we have. That's the conclusion I've come to. Do you think there are things about life, the universe, about death that we aren't meant to know as humans, that it's part of our experience to live with that mystery? Um, well, I think the I think exactly the point of this incarnation, and again, these are my thoughts, not facts. Exactly the point in, of this incarnation is that we shouldn't know for sure. Yeah, what's going on? We should always have that doubt. Uh, Part of the human experience. Yeah, and and we should we should only if we were absolutely certain what was going to happen, um, then then the opportunity to learn from this incarnation would be would be more difficult. I mean, in, in Buddhism, they have this notion of bodhisattvas, and and they have this notion of nirvana that one can go through, through many lifetimes, many incarnations, mm -hmm. and eventually, you reach a place, where you've learned all the lessons, you've you've done all the work, and and you kind of graduate to nirvana. Um, but the bodhisattvas are those who've done all the work and learned all the lessons, but they consciously choose to come back into incarnation, mm -hmm. in order to teach and to help others. It's a very interesting system of system of thought that they that they have there. I mean, let's face it; it's all it's all an enormous mystery. And uh, you know, psychedelics, which are the primary subject of our conversation today, uh, are very helpful tools in in exploring that mystery and discovering and, and learning more about ourselves and more about the extraordinary gift of of being alive as a human being. What would you say to people who? have that calling to experiment with psychedelics or maybe ayahuasca, mm -hmm. but they're afraid of it. I would say the fear is a good thing in that case. It, it, it needs to be taken very seriously. These are, these are very serious medicines. You are going to have experiences that will test you. Um, and, and it's quite normal 
to be uh, frightened of testing experiences. But then the, the next stage, at a certain point, if you, if you feel the calling strong enough, you're going to have to overcome your fear. I had fear when I first drank ayahuasca. As a matter of fact, I still do have fear. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. You know, as I said, I haven't drunk ayahuasca since 2019. I will drink it again. Um, but I will be bracing myself for that mm -hmm. experience. And I, and I don't know exactly where it's going to go. I hope you know that I've learned lessons as I've gone along that will make it a lighter journey for me than has sometimes been the case been the case in the past. But these are not recreational substances. Right. Uh, it's not like drinking a beer or something. No, yeah. <laughs> ayahuasca is not about recreation. And and anybody who thinks that, you know, vomiting and diarrhea have right. anything to do with <laughs> recreation. Why I'm scared of just, it. Just needs to have that journey with ayahuasca. But in the Amazon, they see that as a, a, a purging, as yeah. a necessary purging, that you're ridding your body of Cleansing. toxins and also of psychic toxins. That have built up. Mm. That's what's mm. that's what's being released in that um, in that purging that takes place. Yeah. Part of the reason I'm so afraid of ayahuasca, I know one time in my life I will do it. Mm -hmm. I, hopefully many times. Yeah. I'm afraid of it because of the idea that DMT is released in our brains mm -hmm. when we die. Yeah. And I fear that maybe I'm not supposed to experience that until I die. Mm. No, the shamans in the Amazon will tell you otherwise. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is the plant that, that, that that's, um, it's the vine of the dead, the vine of souls. That's fundamentally what ayahuasca mm. is. It's a Quechua word. It's a word from the Inca language. It has, it's named many other names in the Amazon itself, but the Incas also used ayahuasca, which they learned from the Amazonian peoples. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were simply translating the meaning of that word into their language. And it means the vine of the dead or the vine of souls. And primarily, uh, it is about learning what you need to know to have a good death. That's, that's primarily what it's about. And that's why I think it's so important and why it's been so important for me. Um, and I, I hope as a result of it that I am a more evolved person than I was in 2003. Um, and that I have learned things about myself that I needed to know mm -hmm. uh, and that I can be more helpful to others than I used to be in the past. And that I can give love uh, wherever, wherever possible, support, kindness, encouragement. We all need it, you know. We, yeah. all, we all need that. And we give too little of that, that love, that support, that kindness, and that encouragement to others. Mm. So I hope that uh, I have learned some of, some of the lessons, uh, even though, as I said, I am definitely a work in progress yeah. and still full of faults and errors. Um, as all humans should as be. As all humans should be. Yeah. I was trying to figure out a way to segue this to our next episode. Yeah. Kind of ended on a, mm. you know, and our next episode preview. Is, is going to be to do with my controversial work on the possibility of a lost civilization of yep. the of the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. um, well, the segue for me is I, I'm 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 quite certain that uh, whatever exactly that was, psychedelics played an important role within it. Um, they were they were very important. They've been important in the human story throughout. Just as we live in a world today, where hunter gatherer communities coexist on a global sale, scale with advanced technological societies. I think it was the same during the Ice Age, but just the, unlike our society, which is distance, distance itself from the shamanistic experience, I think that the lost civilization that I am trying to be an advocate of and make a case for emerged out of shamanism. Mm. I think shamanism was the root and the ground of that civilization, and it offered many different paths forward. Uh, and one of those paths was to continue hunter gathering, and another of those paths was to go in a different, a different direction that we might recognise as um, even technological in certain ways, but not the kind of technology that we have today. Uh, I think psychedelics were a key were a key part of it. All theory, of course, yeah, right, right, not right. fact. Yeah, but we can talk about it further. Well, yeah, and you just to kind of piggyback off that, the shamanistic experience and the psychedelic experience, and part of that is seeing shapes and fractals and colors sacred mm. geometry and geometry yeah. how that is so prevalent through not only the civilization that that you're speaking of but also just across all of the megalithic sites across throughout the, world. the ancient world yeah um geometry is 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 of key importance and and these um huge earthworks that are being discovered in the amazon now they're all geometrical uh, on an enormous scale yeah. we'll talk about that in the next episode right right it's not just all coincidence and no, no, no. <laughs> and all of that but we're going to go ahead and wrap up this episode there. We could go on and on for hours and hours, yes. but we're uh, getting prepped for the next episode on the ancient apocalypse and mm -hmm. this lost civilization. So much to dig into. Yeah. 
Um, where can people find you and keep up with your work? Well, the best way is my website, which is simply grahamhancock.com. Okay. And there are links to my Facebook page and my, my Twitter page on there. It was my kids who talked me into getting into <laughs> yeah. social media yeah. uh, back about 2008 or 2009. I didn't understand what it was for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, it's rightly thought of as a, as a poisoned gift. There, there are amazing ish aspects of social media which are mm -hmm. very important and which are allowing people to share and form, and form communities of ideas. But there are also extremely negative aspects of social media. Uh, but in the world today, uh, if, if, if you're an author, as I am, if you want your work to be read and visited by, by people all over the world, you have to engage with, with social media. Yeah, and, so uh, true. And, and I do, uh, as, as, as much as I can. I haven't got an Instagram page. I'm, my, yeah. my, you don't my, need kids, one. my kids are all way grown up now and haven't taught me how to do that. But I probably won't, I probably yeah. won't do that. Um, and I, I learn useful things through the social media as well as a lot of unpleasantness. There's also oh, a yeah. lot of really yeah. good things. And, and, um, from time to time, somebody will post a comment that actually teaches me something new mm -hmm. that I need to explore or, or send a link to something I didn't know about that I need to know about. And that's really, really helpful. Yeah. It's a great way to share information. Yeah. 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 I also wanted to quickly just shout out Annabelle yes. for reaching out to us. She's a listener viewer. Mm -hmm. and she actually was the one who helped connect us with yes. with Graham. That's so right. thank you so much. I mean, this is an absolute treat to have, have Annabelle's a dear, dear friend of our family, dear friend of ours, and her parents were dear friends of mine and my wife, Santa. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you so much for, yeah. for connecting us. This has been amazing. Seriously, I'm so excited you, to dive into the ancient civilization stuff because there's a whole lot to unpack there. So we will see you guys then. And until then. Take your mind a mile higher. Thank you.